Every time I come in on an evening service like this, I say to myself, well, I wonder how many we've run off, and you all show up, so that's good. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> all right, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Genesis 3.15 tonight. Genesis 3.15. And I'm sure you're praying for the, uh, the American citizens that are stranded right now in Afghanistan, also those brave Af Afghanistanis that helped us, and the translators, and uh, they just they threw their lot in with the United States and pray that we do not leave them in that place. The thing they teach you in the military is you do not leave your buddies laying out on the battlefield. You get them and you bring them in. All right, in, in the book of Genesis 3.15, I want you to notice what it says here now. The Lord said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Father, bless this book now. In your holy name, amen. There's a lot of conjectures to what has to do with the seed of serp the serpent seed. That gets off into an entirely different thing tonight. That's not the issue with me. But in Genesis 3.15, this is definitely the seed of the woman, which would be the Mashiach, the Messiah. God has already intervened and showed them how he intends to do something because of the entrance of sin into the world. This is not, didn't take God off guard. It didn't, he didn't have to react to it, folks. The, the Lord Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God shed from the foundation of the world before man was ever made. But what you have here is the beginning of something that uh, goes all the way through the Bible. Now, Satan has to find out for himself, and Satan, of course, when he sees, when he hears this in Genesis chapter number 3 and verse 15, he knows that God is serious now about bringing a Savior in because of the sin of mankind. And so what does he do? Well, if you'll notice on over here in chapter number 6, it says in verse number 9, these are the generations of Noah. All right. Note carefully, the word generation shows up 14 times in your Bible. There's 14 generations. Each one of them are, are specific to something and very important about something. This generation here is talking about of Noah. He was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. All right, so what happens here is the, he, the Hebrew word tanim is translated as perfect in his generations. Why this? Because Satan had tried to to come into the human family and mix them with angels and therefore corrupting the seed of Genesis 3.15, which would have brought the prophecy to naught. And of course, God's not going to let that happen. The Lord knows what he's doing. And, but he gives Satan, he gives him a long, he gives him, he gives him a lot of space. Go ahead, Satan, do your thing. Like he said in the book of Job, go ahead, take him, do what you would with Job. Just spare his life. So in Genesis chapter number 6 and verse number 9, we have the generations of Noah. This is important because the generations of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, verse number 10. Shem, Ham, and Japheth produce for us what's called, look at chapter number 10 of the book of Genesis. Genesis 10. This is what's called the table of the nations. Look at verse 1. These are the generations of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Unto them were born sons, unto them were sons born after the flood. This is what's called the table of nations. This is where all the nations came from. Every last one of us walking this earth either came from Shem or from Ham or from Japheth. One of the three. That's it. It's that simple. And, uh, of course, we all came from Noah. Noah came from Adam. So this makes us all, makes humanity brothers in that sense. And this is what it's talking about in the book of Acts when he says he hath made of all men one blood. And that's because we're brothers, the Lord Jesus, the, the, that Adam was the first Adam. And that we came from him. But it's important for this in chapter number 10 because then we begin to trace the genealogy of Shem. And this is why it's important because it is through Shem that we find the, uh, we find the promise. Look at chapter number 11, verse number 27. See the word generation show up again? Uh, Gen uh, Genesis 11, verse 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And so therefore Lot was kin to Abram. And Haran died before his father, Terah, in the land of his nativity, and Ur the Chaldees. So Terah never left the home. Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, 
and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishka. But Sarai was barren, and she had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there, which is in Syria. It's north of Jerusalem. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died. Now what follows in chapter number 12 is God introducing himself personally to Abram. He called him already from Ur of the Chaldees. But God reveals himself to you in segments, in segments, in segments, in segments. We only know so much about the Lord because we're only capable of knowing so much about the Lord. There's no human being that's ever walked the face of this earth that could take in the immensity, the holiness of Almighty God, but the Lord Jesus Christ. He could, but he's the only one. This is why the Bible says when God gave the Holy Spirit to the Lord Jesus, he did not give it to him by measure, but the rest of us he did give by measure because we can only handle so much of that holiness. So we have here now, we follow this in genealogy, and we're not going to spend a lot of time in genealogies, but it's important to remember that these are the generations, generations, generations. See, the Bible's a, a remarkable book, folks. The Bible's a wonderful book. If you could just look at the Bible through the eyes of the Bible, instead of trying to look at it through the eyes of a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian or a Catholic, just read the Bible. Let the Bible speak for itself, and you'd be amazed at what you've got in your hands here. It took nearly 2,000 years to write it. Now, if you look at the book of Esther, chapter number 3 and verse number 7, we have these generations, and now we come down uh, Esther, chapter number 3 and verse number 7. In the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast purr, this is lots, like dice. They cast purr, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month, and that is the month Adar. And Haman said unto the king, King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces and so forth, they're different from everyone else. They are. They still are. And these are Jews he's talking about. And what you have in it, the book of Esther is a pogrom. Now, what is a pogrom? Well, you've read about the six million Jews that Hitler uh, killed in World War II. He literally tried to eradicate the Jew from, from, from the world. And... Uh, and, and he, got, he killed about six million, maybe a few more. I don't know I don't know him by count of the head count. But he killed a lot of people trying to get rid of the Jew. So that's a pogrom. And this is what Haman was trying to do here under Ahasuerus. He wanted to get rid of the Jew. Now, why did he do that? Because Haman had a vendetta against Israel, against, against the Jewish people, because of his ancestor Agag. Agag was an Amalekite. And an Amalekite was a descendant of Esau, and Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of pottage. So therefore we have someone who is going to usurp the place of spiritual authority, blessingness, and gifts. So what we have here is that Haman has a vendetta against the, uh, against the Jews because of what Samuel did back there when the Bible says he took a sword and he hacked Agag to pieces. Why did he do that? Because Saul refused to do what God told him to do. He was to take the Amalekites and he was to do away with them. And what he did was to bring Agag back and then he brought the sheep and the cattle, the oxen, and the goodly, the goodly spoil from what he had done. And Saul came to, Solomon, uh, to Samuel and says, Your servant hath done what the Lord asked of me to do. And then what Samuel said to him is one of those things in the Bible that you don't forget. Samuel said, well, then what meaneth the bleeding of these sheep if you've done what God said to do? And, of course, he hadn't. And he took a sword and he hewed Agag to pieces. God said, I will have war with Amalek from generation to generation to generation to generation. In plain words, I will never make peace with Amalek. There will never be any peace made. 
Now you can make peace with the Philistines. You can make peace with the with the uh, uh, with with the, with the Syrians or the Assyrians or the Babylonians or whatever. But there is no peace to ever be made with Amalek. And so Haman was going to do away with the Jews. Now there's a beautiful picture here. Esther is the one God uses to save his people. But her Hebrew name is Hadassah. Esther is a pagan name. It comes from Ishtar. Ishtar is the queen of heaven. It's their, it's their form of it. The queen of heaven showed up in practically every culture in the Old Testament, sometimes under a different name, but still the same thing, queen of heaven. And so Ishtar, Esther, and they changed Hadassah's name to Esther. And now there's a lot of the Jewish women today. I do a little reading in this. Now the Jewish women love the name Esther. You'd be amazed. Just type it in and do a Google. You'd be amazed at how many Jewish women are named Esther. And I think a lot of them are named that because they want to identify themselves with the Esther of the book of Esther. But her name is Hadassah. Hadassah means myrtle. Myrtle is a beautiful flower and it has a wonderful fragrance. And a myrtle is edible. You can eat it. And that's, uh, you know, you can't eat all flowers. Don't, don't say Preacher Lawson told you to go out tonight and eat all the flowers you find. <laughs> no, sir. But the myrtle is edible. But a dog or a cat or a horse or something like that, if they ate that myrtle that you can eat, it'll kill them. Now, think about what I'm telling you tonight. The food was only for you. The beauty of holiness through this woman, of Hadassah, of the myrtle, of the fragrance. God said he smelled a sweet fragrance when the Lord Jesus Christ offered himself up to the Lord. You see, in the, in the nostrils of God, every time he saw Hadassah, he smelled something sweet. Every time. And he saw something beautiful. What we need to learn is to appreciate the beauty that God gives us. What God calls beautiful. I don't care anything about what Hollywood calls beautiful. What does God call beautiful? And that sweet fragrance. And I thought, that's a wonderful thing. To take a man that's eaten up with, with the vindictiveness and pit him against a woman who was willing to die for her people. You see, Hadassah was one of the greatest women in that whole Bible. If you want to teach your little girls to, to, to pattern themselves after somebody, teach them to pattern themselves after this woman. Read that book and show them how as she was courageous. Now, she had physical beauty. I know that. And Ahasuerus wanted to add her to his harem and all of that. And, but God used that and overruled it for good and for the better. And this is the way he constantly does things. He takes, he'll take the lust of a man or the fear of a man, and he'll still overrule it and bring something good out of it. This is what Romans 8's talking about. He worketh all things together for good, for those that love God, for those that are called according to his purpose. So we find, we find, we find Haman trying to do away with the Jews. Why? Genesis 3.15. Matthew chapter number 2 and verse number 16. When the Lord Jesus Christ is born, we have an Idumean a descendant of Esau, another usurper to the throne, sitting on the throne of Israel, Herod the Great. Herod the Great is like Peter the Great and Catherine the Great and all the rest of the greats. There's nothing great about them. <laughs> I mean, when you start and talk, calling people the Great, the Great, the Great, forget it. What do we have that we didn't receive of the Lord? And what are we without the grace of God? I'm not any better than you and you're not any better than me. We're all the same when it comes to the love of God and the gifts and callings of God. So I don't care anything about Herod the Great. We're talking about Herod, the murdering devil that had his own wife put to death, his own children. He's one of the sorriest dogs that ever walked the face of this earth. And he wanted to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. And he had, look what it says. Then Herod, Matthew 2, 16, when he saw that he was mocked to the wise men, showed how wise those wise men really were, didn't it? was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. Did you just kind of meditate on that? You know, don't just fly across that. Look at that. This is a monster. Okay? This is a monster. 
and note carefully, and at all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he diligently inquired of the wise men. Here again, here again, the devil is trying to wipe Genesis 3.15 clean. Now don't you look over here in Matthew chapter number 12 and verse 14. The Lord Jesus Christ shows up. Satan had to learn who he was. He had to find out who he was. He did that on his own. And then once he did, look at Matthew 12, 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. The word council shows up in the Bible. It's always in a bad context. They held a council against him, how they might destroy him. And if you go and continue, continue reading in that chapter, in the next one you'll see where they, they said he's demon-possessed. And everything he does, he does by the power of Beelzebub. He does it by the power of the devil. And it is in that context the Lord Jesus Christ says, I'm going to tell you something. Be careful that you don't blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. Because when you blaspheme against him, you can say a word against me, he said. But when you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you're finished. There's no forgiveness in this world or in the world to come. That's a solemn thing. That's something to be very careful about. And they were attributing the work of the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Because everything Christ did, he did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. They were taking that and saying the devil did that. That's what got him in trouble. Look at Matthew 27, verse 1. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. They had dead set to get rid of this man. They're going to get rid of him. Luke chapter number six, chapter, Mark chapter three, Mark chapter three, verse six. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians. This was a sect. The Herodians, it's like the zealots of the time. They had some different sects, just like the, uh, <coughs> the Essenes, the so-called Essenes at Qumran. 2,000 years ago, you had different sects. The zealots were the ones who were f strong for a homeland. You see, they, they saw everything as a usurper, even Herod. He was a usurper to them. Whereas the Herodians, they supported Herod. And then the Essenes just moved out of town, and they went down to the Dead Sea. And we can be thankful to the Essenes, at least this, this is what most of them think. We can be thankful to the Essenes for the Dead Sea Scrolls that they found in 1947 and continued to find after that. We can be thankful to the Essenes for that because they taught us a lot. And it was with them, those Dead Sea Scrolls folks, that they found a 57 foot long copy of the book of Isaiah. And you can't understand how important that is if you just think about it for a moment. And they date that one back to about 200 BC, maybe 250 BC. When was Isaiah written? 700 B.C. So you're only looking at a difference 450, 500 years between the original Isaiah and what they found. And what they found, that 57-foot long Isaiah, agrees with the Isaiah you've got in your Bible. That's quite a thing, don't you think? Here's what it tells me. God can preserve his word, but it also tells me God uses the Jews to preserve his word. They, he does. Now, the Masoretes, the Masoretes, and we get the Masoretic vowel points, the Masoretes were the ones who uh, were part of preserving the scripture because they were, they were connected to what's called the Sopharim. Sopher in Hebrew means to write. They were the writers. And so therefore, they took every page of the Bible, every word, and they numbered it, they marked it, they located it, and then they put a, a, a wide column on that page, right next to it. On every page there'd be a wide column. And that was called the Masora. The Masora's purpose was to locate this, okay? And this is where we get Masoretic. We get the Masoretes from Masora, the keepers of the scripture, the ones who saw to it that the word of God was handed down to us. We ought to be thankful to the Jews. You wouldn't have an Old Testament if it wasn't for the Jews. <laughs> you sure didn't get anything from the Gentiles. You got it from the Jews. Because it says in the book of Romans that they are the they, they're keepers of the oracles of God. And so... Uh, they took counsel how they were going to put him to death. In Luke chapter number 6 and verse 11, and they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. Insane. 
demonic hatred. Did you know there are people in this country that hate the church? They have demonic hatred. And did you know that there are people in this country and in the world that hate the Lord Jesus Christ? You find, you show me anybody, anybody that hates the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll show you a demon possessed. Amen. There's a lot of people out here indifferent to him. They don't think about him, you know. But they don't hate him. They just, you know, well, maybe he lived or whatever. But there are those who despise him. Mark it down. You're dealing with a demon. John 5, 18. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Well, he was. He's God. Amen. He's guilty. He's guilty. <laughs> He's God. In chapter number 11, and verse 53 of John, then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. See this? It continues. It continues. John eleven fifty seven. Now both the chief priest and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. So therefore they dogged him all of his life. And they're going to do their best to do away with this man. They're going to get rid of him. They all had their reasons. They all had their reasons. But the, the truth of the matter is, even though they had a satanic reason, and even though they hated him, and even though they had a, they had a, they had a you know, wicked purpose, they still fulfilled the word of God. Because the Lord Jesus told his disciples, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. And that's when Peter said, not so, Lord. <laughs> no way. And the Lord Jesus said, get thee hence, Satan. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but of men. Peter was speaking as he understood it, as a man's point of view, looking through a man's eyes, understanding the certain circumstances and situation as a man would understand them. The Lord Jesus is saying, Peter, I'm working, I'm, I'm, I'm walking on a much higher level than what you're doing. And you don't understand yet what I'm doing. But of course, he addressed the Satan that was in him because Satan was speaking through him. You say, on the world, preacher, you mean to tell me that Satan can speak through a Christian? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. You better believe he can. Oh, yeah, he can speak through you. He can influence you. He sure can. He can wear you out. I've uh, read a lot of stuff down through the years about uh, people making fun of the devil. And uh, almost without exception, when they get arrogant enough to start making fun of the devil, it winds up costing them greatly. So what do I say about the devil tonight? I respect him. I appreciate the fact that he's stronger than I am. He knows more than I do. He's a spirit being. He's a fallen spirit being. But I also know the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore I am sealed by the Holy Spirit till the day of redemption. And he cannot cross that line. And if I have to deal with the devil as I have before, I do it through the name of Christ. If you remember when the archangel was dealing with Satan over the body of Moses. Do you remember what he said? Over the body of Moses. He said, the Lord rebuke thee, Satan. That's what that archangel said to him. The Lord rebuke thee. In other words, he didn't say, I rebuke thee. He called upon one infinitely higher than himself. And he said, the Lord rebuke thee. That's a great lesson for us folks in the spiritual battle that we're in. You're not going to outsmart him. You're not greater than him. You know, he'll sift you like wheat. But if you'll come against him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and plead the blood covenant that is yours and your identity with Christ and not him. All the, and he, you can't. Here's the bottom line. When you pit him against Christ, guess which one is going to win? Amen. So I know where to run and hide. Amen. <laughs> I'll get behind Christ. He'll deal with the Son of God and not me. John eleven fifty seven, he should show it that they might take him. So they couldn't kill him. They tried to. One time they tried to cast him off of a hill, cliff, Nazareth. He just walked out of their midst. They couldn't do away with him. They wanted to do away with him. They had their, they had their, they had their, their motives, but Satan had his. 
He uses man and man's motives, man's hatred, man's fear, all that makes us what men are. Okay, Satan uses that, but he uses it on a low level. You got to understand this, a very low level, because Satan's got a higher purpose in it. He's got a higher purpose. In everything that happens, he's got a higher purpose. But you see, there's one infinitely above him that has a higher purpose. The ways of the Lord are not our ways. The mind of God is not our mind. He's different from us. He sees the end and the beginning, and he'll work it according to the will of God. So I want to give you three places tonight that the battle was fought, and Satan couldn't stop it. He couldn't stop it. He wanted to. Believe me, he did. The first one is Gethsemane. That word, I think it's an Aramaic word, but it means olive press. Olive press. Olive oil in the Bible is a picture of life. So therefore, it's a place where his very life was being squeezed out of him. He prayed as it were great drops of blood. Gethsemane. Luke chapter 22, verse 41 says, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He didn't have a cup in his hand. He didn't have a cup in his hand. He didn't walk out into Gethsemane with a cup. The cup was symbolic of something that was in that cup. And what was in that cup? The wrath of God. The wrath of God. And he wanted it to remove from him. You mean he was afraid to die on the cross? If you hear a preacher say that, and a lot of good preachers out there, and they mean well, I don't question their love for the Lord, but they are as ignorant of the Bible as they can be. It was not the death on the cross that he was concerned with. It was the coming anger, rage, and holiness of Almighty God. It was coming upon him. It was settling down upon him. And he knew it would make a difference if you live a thousand lifetimes. You cannot prepare yourself for that because as a man, remember this now, as a man, the God-man, he walked into the darkest place, the lowest place, the most trying time that any human being has ever been in. He went there. And at Gethsemane, you might call it the door was opened. It was a place of real anguish in the soul. His soul was, ang was, was, was anguished, burdened, and this came down upon him. Now, what I'm going to say to you tonight is holy ground. And I would that you'd meditate on what I'm saying. There's some passages in the Bible that are just kind of you know, they're there to it's historical document and so forth. But this is the strongest theology that you'll find in the Bible. It doesn't get any stronger than this. It doesn't get any more important than this. When you go through what I'm talking about tonight, and you really get a hold of it in your heart, you will have nothing but contempt, pure contempt for any man or any woman, for them to think that they can do anything to add to what was done here, to add to it. In other words, oh, I know I'm saved, but no, no. You remember I told you about the card the other day, and there's two things that are missing from it. The one who talked about uh, being hurt by the, by, the, by the lake of fire. Blood was not in there, and the new birth was not in there. The reason the new birth is not in there is because if you're born of the Spirit of God, you're sealed till the day of redemption. You're marked. That seal not only seals you in, but it marks you as belonging to the Lord. And you're kept by the power of God. You become a son of God by the new birth. You literally do become a son of God by the new birth. Nothing can change that. Nothing can change that. You cannot be, you cannot be turned into not being a son of God. Once that happens, it's forever. This is why the Gospel of John is the last Gospel written. 90 A.D., Matthew, Mark, and Luke deal with the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven's already passed. That time has passed. He's no longer saying to the Syrophoenician woman, 
It's no food for here you on this table. It's not me to take the, the food of the children and give it to dogs. You remember her? She says, yea, Lord, but it, the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table. He said that in Matthew chapter 15. Now, that's important to understand this. He said that in Matthew chapter number 15. And she said, yea, Lord, that's all right. I'll eat crumbs that fall from the table. All right. He stepped outside of the covenant relationship that he was building with Israel because he came to Israel to offer them the kingdom of heaven. He did not come to Gentiles to offer them the kingdom of heaven. But he put it in stop and he reached over and touched a Gentile and said, be it unto thee according to your faith. That's a great thing to learn. Yes, sir. It didn't stop the kingdom of heaven. But for just a moment, the Syrophoenician woman received the grace of God because of her, her faith in the Lord Jesus. Gethsemane is something that you need to think about. Think about it. Every time I went to the Holy Land, I went to Gethsemane. Gethsemane is one of the most uh, visited sites in the Holy Land. No question about it. Visited so much that they've rubbed the trees bare. Rub the bark off of them. I didn't say cut it off. I mean rub it off. The Lord only knows how many prayers have been offered up there, how much sorrow and anguish the people that come in there and pray. But it's there, Gethsemane. But the next thing I want you to look at is Calvary. These are the three things now that come to the consummation of the life of Christ. If he was not able to perform these and do what was necessary in them, then Genesis 3.15 would have been brought to naught. You see? Even though Satan couldn't kill him, he might work on him here, and he did. According to the book of Psalm, chapter number 22, it says that the bulls of Bashan encompass thee. You read and then you read about the bulls of Bashan, you'll find out that they say that Bashan is what's called the Golan Heights today. And they had great cattle. It was well watered. It was a wonderful place to raise your cattle and all the rest of that. So a bull from Bashan was a prime example of the, of, of the best that you could have from a bull, from a cow, you see. Well, my dear friend, he's not talking about a bull coming up while he's hanging on the cross. There aren't any bulls standing around there while he's on the cross. These bulls are like the fowls that light in the trees in those, in those, in those parables. They represent evil spirits. They represent the wickedness of Satan. You see, if you couldn't stop him from the cross, he would destroy him on the cross. And that's what Calvary was about, because he came to destroy him. I'll do away with you now. I will strip you of your faith. You'll, you'll die on this cross abandoned from God. And he did abandon him. God did abandon him. And the Bible says he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That meant that he became the essence of sin. Don't you stop tonight, because I do. I'm not so sure we even understand what that means. This is holy stuff. This, this is the kind of stuff to meditate on. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. I can, I've got commentaries and some, a lot of them say, well, he became the sin offering. Well, that might be part of it, but it's far more going on than that. He's far more than just the sin offering. He became sin for us. Well, he, rep he became every sin that you've ever committed. You know, all the bad stuff that men have ever committed, committing now and ever will commit. Sure, that falls under the general category of sin. But where did sin start? Where did it originate? What's its essence? This is what we're dealing with at the cross. He became sin for us. In plain words, Almighty God is looking down upon his son that he has abandoned. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He cried. And he's looked down upon his son that he has abandoned. And he's made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. And then the wrath of God. In other words, what's that mean, preacher? That's the judgment of God. He's judged at Calvary like you'd be judged if you weren't saved. They judged him. He judged him. And what did he say? He found him worthy of death. So he died. It doesn't get any more holy than this. He died. And the third thing is death itself. Look at Hebrews chapter number 5 and verse number 7. What's the wages of sin? 
What more can sin do to you if you're dead? Does God punish a corpse? The wages of sin is death. Death when it is finished, it bring, I mean, sin when it is finished, it bringeth forth what? Death. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Therefore, the only thing left for him was to die. And so therefore, in spite of the fact that the full wrath of God was coming down upon his soul, the Bible said he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. That's Old Testament scripture. And he saw the travail of his soul. He's not talking about the pain of his body. He's talking about the travail of his soul. He's talking about what the Lord Jesus Christ was going through spiritually. Now, I'm not trying to diminish at all the suffering of physical death on the cross. That was horrendous. No question about that. In Psalm 22 and other places, it's as clear as it can be. His joints were out of, uh, out of shape. He, he, his, his, his whole body, his tongue, his, his insides were poured out like a potsherd. He's taught, that's the physical death. That's the crucifixion. But when he says, I shall, he saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. He's saying by that, I could see inside him. I saw what his soul was accepting and had become. That, my dear friend, God bless your soul tonight. If you could, if you could just think with me for a minute. Think with me. The cross was horrible. But the cross was not, that was not what, uh, that's not what bore him down. It was the wrath of God on sin. And God saw that travail. And he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Even though God had abandoned him, made a curse out of him, made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, the Lord Jesus Christ reached up into heaven and spoke to his father and said, I know you. I know who you are. There's nothing here on this cross that I can turn to. There's no light here. There's no hope here. There's nothing here but death. But Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. That's like the Syrophoenician woman sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When the Son of God reached back up to his Father and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, the Father had to accept him because he did it by faith. Then it brings us to the third part. Satan couldn't stop him at Gethsemane. He couldn't stop him at the cross. And so now we hit something from Hebrews chapter number 5 and verse number 7, and that's death itself. And look what it says, Hebrews 5 and verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. All right. In the days of his flesh would be when? It's when he was walking on this earth, right? When he was at Gethsemane. And I'm, this may very well refer to more than just Gethsemane. When he offered prayers and supplications to God with strong crying and tears. Now look at this carefully. Unto him that was able to save him from death. Save him from death. You say, well, he's talking about the death of the cross. Is he? Read on. And was heard in that he feared. He was not saved from the death of the cross. But he was saved from the death that he prayed about. Yeah. And what is that? That is the condemnation and curse and damnation. Becoming sin for us who knew no sin. To bear the wrath of God upon that cross. There to have nothing, nothing, nothing that he could turn to any help at all whatsoever. And there he committed himself into the hands of God the Father. He was heard in that he feared. In plain words, I feel it. I know it. It's coming from you. It's not coming. No man could do this to me. It's coming in wave after wave of holy righteousness upon sin upon salvation of mankind, why I came into this world, what I'm here for. This is it. It is for this moment. And I give myself back to thee. And was heard in that he feared. He feared God in every, every way you possibly could. And the Bible said he saved him from death. What's that mean? Look at Acts chapter 13, verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. Acts 17, verse 31. 
because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Romans chapter number 10 and verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. See anything here? Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Ephesians 1.20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. And then in Colossians 2.12, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Now, this is an exact quote, okay? There are far more passages in the New Testament that refer to the resurrection of Christ than just these. But this is how many of them are exactly word for word the same. Who hath raised him from the dead. Over and over and over and over and over again. It's almost like Almighty God wants you to understand how important it is that he raised him from the dead. <laughs> because I live, he said, ye shall live also. He raised him from the dead. I miss the, the Trinity is a mystery to me. I believe it and th halfway think I understand it. But then sometimes I throw my hands up and think, no, I'm not sure I understand it or not. But I do know that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost dwelt in the Lord Jesus Christ bodily when he was here on this earth. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. So the Lord Jesus Christ was God walking in flesh. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. The church of God, Acts chapter 20, verse number 28, which he hath bought, the church of God, which he hath bought with his own blood. God's got blood. Amen. Let's think about that tonight. We owe him, don't we? We've got something to be thankful for. Well, preacher, you know, I just believe you, you have to live the right kind of life. Well, you go right on living that life. And then when you stand before Almighty God, you'll see how much your life lived will count to him. He wants you to live right now. I'm not saying don't live right. But you live right, you live right as a consequence of the fact that something has changed within you. That's good. That's a good thing. But you must know that there is a time when you changed and you're not who you used to be. Father, bless your word. Bless your holy word, Lord. I think I halfway understand some of the suffering, the mental suffering, Father, the, the spiritual suffering that our Lord Jesus Christ went through. Just a little bit of it, I understand. Not a whole lot. But it's enough to run cold chills up and down my spine. I praise your name tonight for who you did for us. You love us. Pray for every soul in this house and those that are watching this thing as it's streamed, those that will watch it later. I pray for every one of them. Your word will not return void. It will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you've sent it. Even if it is stolen away, it'll still accomplish what you please. In thy name I pray. Amen.